I'm an architect and co-founder of a Danish architect company called Effect. Um, we work within urban planning, design of buildings and landscapes, and research. And so it's actually our jobs to design the cities and the buildings and the landscapes of, uh, of tomorrow. We call it Effect because it's the Danish word for impact. And we want to measure every project that we do and the positive impacts it has on the surroundings. Some six years ago, we started looking at a bigger scale and a bigger scope of impact, namely the impact that our civilization is currently having on its natural surroundings. Like what you see up here is uh, some graphs that show the evolution of the last 250 years. It goes under the name the Great Acceleration because all these graphs are exponential. On the left hand side, you see the socioeconomic trends. On the other side, you see the ecological impacts. Let me give you a few examples here. This is the global population growth exponentially. And uh, from that, you have the uh, energy consumption also exponentially growth. You have the waste, the water use. You have the air trips that we do. You have the uh, derived uh, impact of concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere, of massive deforestation, of species getting extinct at a speed and a rate that we cannot believe, and of global warming. We're already one degree beyond uh, pre-industrial uh, age. When you put all these graphs together, you get this uh, image of the industrial age or the fossil age, uh, kind of a portrait of, of our age, starting 250 years ago and until now ending up here in this peak, which is where we are. When you see that, it's hard to be the kind of ever optimistic architect, which we are normally. Architects are quite optimistic. But this is like really concerning. So when understanding this, we decided to uh, make this into a challenge and start uh, seeing if we could get uh, projects and assignments and, and jobs that could help us break this curve. To get there, it demands collaboration across sectors, across industries. But we see this as the biggest design challenge of our age we need to move towards a civilization that reconnects with uh, the natural world that we are part of and that we deeply depend upon to, uh, to survive. We call that transition, the transition from ego to eco. So we started looking for projects that uh, could help us uh, make this uh, trip. And uh, we found a great project in an American startup called Regen Villages. They asked us, how do we build self-sustaining communities that feed and power themselves? And we decided to, uh, to help them. Like looking into feeding yourself in a city, you have to look into agriculture. And we thought that has nothing to do with architecture. So we looked back a few thousand years, 10,000 years, to the beginning of urbanization. There were no cities, no settlements before we had agriculture. So from the beginning of history, agriculture and urbanism has been closely linked. And for the last 10,000 years, the way we've developed our cities has been organically linked to how we grow food. Only after the industrialization, the city and the agriculture was disconnected. Suddenly, we could have endless farming, endless livestock, endless cities, and apparently endless food supply. We started going kind of behind these images, trying to understand this, this industry, global industry of producing food. Turns out we use 42% of the global surface on producing food. It's an area the size of Africa and South America together. This is the biggest factor of deforestation and uh, loss of biodiversity. It's also the biggest uh, consumer of fresh water. 70% goes into agriculture. It's also the biggest single sector emitting greenhouse gases, 30% uh, is related to agriculture. It's also an emitter of nitrogen and phosphorus into our uh, freshwater uh, environments. So what we do when we've produced all this food is that we transport it on an average 2,400 kilometers, and then we waste one-third, and still we have one-seventh of the global population going to bed hungry. Now, can you believe this? We couldn't, but it's, these are the dry facts of how the world is producing food today.
And the fact is that we are going to meet, need even more food as the global popula uh, population is, uh, is growing and as the urban population is growing. So we need to come up with new solutions, many new solutions. And region villages is one solution to how to, uh, to change this way of, of producing food. So we started up in a completely different uh, place, looking at what is the demand for one single family to produce enough energy, water and food to be self-sufficient and to recycle uh, the organic waste. You need only 639 square meters. It's not a lot. It's a small plot in a suburb. So we uh, added that up to 25 families, making that the program for the city. This prototype is developed for a, uh, a place called Elmir in, uh, in, in Holland. So we decided, since it was a greenfield development, to put the uh, houses in a circle and the food production in the center. In there, we also put all the social functions, the culture house, the playgrounds, the shared car service. And around it, there's enough space to grow food in a food forest uh, and to have uh, 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 nature and biodiversity come back into this uh, previous farmland. The basic systems were actually kind of uh, using the greenhouses to collect rainwater and sun to produce the food that then fed the families and the waste is then decomposed and put back into the system. So it's a small circular system. And we thought it was pretty ingenious, but in fact, it's a quite old system. Uh, it's how Mother Earth is working when you have uh, forest and other uh, ecosystems. It's exactly like that. So we basically copied that. And we had to make it a little bit more complex, uh, putting in all the, the devices we need to control the flow of uh, energy water, waste, and, uh, and to make sure that, that, that all aspects uh, uh, got developed well. So this is working completely on existing technologies, but we just put them together in a new way. There are different ways of farming. Here's an image from one of the vertical farms uh, in the center of the city. You can see how uh, crops can be farmed uh, vertical. And uh, in the floor, you have the fish uh, receiving the waste, and the waste of the fish becomes fertilizer for the plants. We also uh, made sure to have social facilities around this food production, because we wanted people to reconnect with the food that they eat, also when it was produced. The homes were developed also like little greenhouses or winter gardens, because uh, we wanted the people in the village to reconnect with uh, the food produc production also inside their homes, but also reconnect with the nature uh, around the village. The village, like put together, is like a small machine. So instead of making a house where you need to buy energy, water, and food, you actually have that production inside the community. And we envision that to be the way that our future cities should work. This is uh, how it looks from the outside, looking from the food forest towards the village. And this is a nighttime image when the light comes up in all these uh, small glass houses. What happened when we launched this in uh, 2014 at the Venice, uh, or 16, at the Venice Biennale was quite uh, surprising. Millions of people started sharing this project on uh, social media and it went completely viral. And we got uh, emails from all over the world from people who wanted to be part of the project. Complete surprise, but to us it showed that there's actually quite a global demand for this kind of solution if you design it uh, well. So, uh, we used uh, this knowledge to, uh, to move on to see how can we apply these solutions into other projects as well, while region villages are still financing their first development. We did this project north of Copenhagen. This is 700 homes, suburban development, but we changed that into a landscape plan with a food forest and little villages in between. And you can see the white roofs in the middle of the image. Those are the, 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 the greenhouses of the collective farm you have in the center. We developed uh, small projects for the harbor of Copenhagen, taking urban farming uh, into the water, doing a, an oyster farm with an oyster bar on top. And uh, we're working on this project currently, which is uh, taking off-grid development into the uh, hospitality sector. This is a hotel in the woods uh, south of Copenhagen. And we're working to take uh, vertical uh, growing and gardens uh, into higher dense development. This is a project that we're working on in, in Bangalore currently. So last year we were invited to 
endeavor into a new uh, research project together with the uh, Danish energy company called Ørsted. They were asking us, how do we design homes that produce more than they consume? Ørsted is envisioning a world that runs entirely on green energy, so they sold off their, o their oil and, and gas, and they're doing only um, renewable energy. But they wanted to have us to help them working with the end consumers to apply new services and appliances at the household scale. So we started to look at, at the single home. Homes are actually like little machines. We don't realize, but they completely shape how we use resources like heating, energy, water and food. And they shape also the outputs in terms of waste, wastewater and emissions. And they shape our behavior. And altogether, they account for one third of our resource consumption. So they have quite an impact. We started by developing the kind of technical solutions like we did with uh, the region village and found that the big challenge wasn't actually applying the technology that could make a home produce more than it uses. The problem we found was much rather the, uh, the people who were going to apply these. We had sociologists uh, visiting the end users for Ørsted and they found that even though all the consumers wanted to be living more sustainable lives, they had mixed, use, mi mixed feelings about sustainability. They said CO2 is like a religion. It's only used to make you feel guilty. Or they said, I wish green was a bit more black and white. So the real challenge was, how do we make these people embrace these new solutions? We decided for a few principles for the Ørsted home. Apart from taking the home from being a rejecter of incoming sun and water and wind, which it is today, to being a collector that produces more than it consumes, we also made the principles that all sustainable applications should go from being a burden to a benefit. So I'm going to show you a few of these uh, ideas and, 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 uh, and solutions we came up with. Some of them are simple and you know them already. For instance, 70 square meters of solar roof is enough to make net positive homes. And if you build it in already uh, in, the, in the beginning of, uh, of the building, you have a building that actually produces and is powered uh, by nature completely. If you add another 10 square meters, you have enough to power your, uh, your cars. So you have completely fuel-free mobility. And who doesn't want that? If you also collect the rainwater that falls on top of that roof, you can get 300 liters of fresh water collected every day. That's enough to cover the consumption if you add a few smart devices to reduce your consumptions altogether. Um, and then you'll be happy when it rains, which we are not usually in Denmark. <laughs> if you add filtration as well, you get clean drinking water. It's not that difficult. We have the solutions to do that. And if you add a composting system inside your home, or you could use the garden if you have a big enough, then you can save 90% of the organic waste that you'd usually just throw out and somebody would drive it somewhere to burn it or put it in a, in a dump. And you can even use that waste as a fertilizer to produce new homegrown food inside your home or in the garden. If you go into the bathroom, we found a device uh, developed by NASA, a circular bath which recycles water. So you only need 12 liters of water recycled. So it's filtered and then it's cleaned with UV. So you get completely clean water back and you don't have to waste heat and water into the drain. But the best is that you get very long and very guilt-free warm showers so you don't have to get out of the shower when you really want to stay. We also looked at the paperless toilet. You might know that application from Japan if you ever visit. You don't need to use paper, you can get washed instead. But we don't apply that in, in, in Europe and uh, in the Americas. But the fact is that we spent a lot of energy and a lot of resources and a lot of water and a lot of bleach on making toilet paper. So if everybody would take upon them to use this uh, solution, you could save 15 million trees and uh, 1.7 trillion liters of water worldwide per year. It's an abstract number, but I can tell you it's a lot. The best is actually that while you save your own ass, you also save the planet. <laughs> and who doesn't want that? 
So the learnings that we took out for this is that most of these devices can actually be purchased uh, on the internet, or you can, it's there, we can buy it. It's all there. We just need to apply it in a smart way into our homes. And as architects, designers, and engineers, we need to really consider how we apply these technologies because that's the way we can create aspiration and that's the way we can scale adoption. Um, so just to get back to this great uh, design challenge and with only 10 year, 12 years to reach uh, the net zero CO2 emissions, that's what UN tells us. We are like in a real hurry and it is concerning and it's a giant challenge that we all have to uh, step in to. But there is a silver lining because the human race, they're quite fast adopters. And to put that into perspective, 12 years is about the time it took for the New Yorkers to go from horse carriage to cars. And it's less time than Steve Jobs needed to make half the world use smartphones. So what we've learned in these projects and what I want you to remember is that all these solutions are available, they're affordable, and they're ready. So in that sense, the future is already here. We just need to apply it, and we need to do it really fast. Thanks. <laughs>